Ever since people and sin started multiplying on this earth, it's been a struggle for God's people to resist the enticements of those who are not God's people. Peer pressure, as it's often called, is one of the most notable ways that Satan tries to pull those who are God's people away from serving God. For there seems to be something within us that wants to be accepted by others and that's afraid of not fitting in with them. Well, the book of Proverbs addresses this situation in Proverbs chapter 1 and verses um, 8 through 19. He says, Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and don't reject your mother's teaching. For they will be a garland of favor on your head and pendants around your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, don't be persuaded. If they say, Come with us, let's set an ambush and kill someone. Let's attack some innocent person just for fun. Let's swallow them alive like Sheol, whole like those who go down to the pit. We'll find all kinds of valuable property and fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot with us, and we'll all share the loot. My son, don't travel that road with them, or set foot on their path because their feet run toward evil and they hurry to shed blood. It is useless to spread a net where any bird can see it, but they set an ambush to kill themselves. They attack their own lives. Such are the paths of all who make profit dishonestly. It takes the lives of those who receive it. The book of Proverbs helps us apply knowledge from God to various circumstances that we face here in this life so that we can please Him. Particularly, the book of Proverbs is written from the perspective of a father instructing a son. And certainly a major part of this father's teaching to his son is to teach him how to respond whenever sinners would entice him to do evil. So the purpose of this study is to learn how sinners will try to entice you and how you must respond so that you please God. First, let's notice that sinners will try to entice you. We can know from this passage and know from other passages of Scripture, the world's full of sinners. The implication in Proverbs 1 and verse 10 is that there are sinners in this world who will try to entice you to do what is wrong. right? If if there weren't, there would be no need for this warning of if sinners entice you. Now, to fully appreciate the nature of this threat, though, you must soberly reflect on the great number of passages that teach us just how many people are, um, are, are like this in Proverbs 1 and verse 10 people who will be trying to entice us in one form or another to do what is evil. Just consider a few passages with me. In Exodus 23 and verse 2, God's people were told you must not follow a crowd in wrongdoing. Now the implication is that a crowd full of people may be guilty of wrongdoing. In fact, they often are guilty of wrongdoing. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Jesus teaches us to enter through the narrow gate because the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. So the fact is, Jesus shows us that most people will live in a way that displeases God and will be eternally lost in hell. So we can just know that most people we face in this life are not really serving God. Next, a little later in Matthew 7, in verses 21 through 23, Jesus tells us that not everyone who says to him, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, he says, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. So Jesus shows that it's not just people who outwardly look like they're doing evil, but he says there's even many people who look like they're following me, but yet they're still involved in wickedness. 
So we cannot let our guards down just because we may be around people who call themselves Christians and uh, believe in Jesus. Next, in 1 John 5 and verse 19, it tells us, we know that we are of God and the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. Because the whole world is under the sway or the influence of Satan, we must be constantly on guard of the influences um, of Satan in this world. So some very sober passages for us to think about as we consider that the world is full of sinners. So take some time to make the concept of if sinners entice you personal and relevant in your life to your unique situation. Think about if your spouse entices you, if your boyfriend or girlfriend entices you, if your children entice you, if your parents entice you, if your neighbors entice you, if your classmates entice you, if your coworkers entice you, if the people you worship with entice you, if the people on social media entice you, if, if the, the people on television entice you, if strangers entice you. Right? Put some names to it. And as you identify where the enticements may come from, it's not that these enticements can only look one particular way. I want you to consider the different forms that this enticement can take in the world. For example, there in Proverbs chapter 1, as we were reading, those enticements particularly address acts of theft and violence. But the enticements from sinners are not limited to this. I mean, if you look over in Galatians chapter 5 and read verses 19 through 21, and you see all these works of the flesh— Sexual morality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. It says, I'm warning you about these things as I warned you before that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, as you notice the anything similar at the end, but here are many works of the flesh that sinners can use to entice you. So you can think about these as well as others that could be similar to these as avenues through which the many sinners who are in this world can use to entice you. Next, we need to appreciate that you and myself as well, we are recovering sinners. We all reach a point at which we have sinned against God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, verse 23. Through Jesus, though, we can be forgiven of that sin, and we can focus again on living for him. Romans 6, verse 23. But from this time of receiving God's forgiveness, we must recognize that we are someone who has struggled against sin in the past, and that we will continue to struggle against sin even in the future. So when sinners entice you, they're not going to be enticing you. Um, They're not going to be appealing to someone who's never given in to the desires of the flesh. Instead, they're going to be appealing to someone who has chosen the desires of the flesh before, above the will of God, and perhaps many times before. We are recovering sinners In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, Paul writes to a group of Christians here. And he lists out all of these sinful things. Sexual morality, uh, idolatry, adultery, and, and on and on. And he says in verse 11, Some of you used to be like this, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So they too were recovering sinners, and we specifically see some of the the sins that they had been guilty of, that they were recovering from. But I want you to notice that being washed, justified, and sanctified did not guarantee their future success against these old temptations and struggles. The same is true with us. We are recovering sinners, and we have to be on guard Because Satan can use these others to, again, appeal to us to go back into the same 
old sinful ways or something else. Next, let's notice very clearly that Satan often works through others. Although Satan is not directly mentioned in Proverbs chapter 1, but his fingerprints are all over what's pictured there in that chapter. While Satan has many different ways that he tempts us, one of the, his most effective tools is trying to work through the others who are under his sway. We talked about 1 John 5 verse 19, the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 10, notice that those who are pictured as doing the enticing right, are sinners. They're called sinners. So Satan has already been effective in enticing them. He's got them under his, um, his deception. And now he's using them as pawns in his service to entice others. That Satan uses others to entice others those who are trying to live for God can be seen throughout the Bible story. But I want to just consider two examples very quickly with you. In the book of Genesis, in chapter 3, the, the second person to sin in the history of the world was impacted to do so by the first person to sin on earth. Right, Genesis six uh, 3, verse 6, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. She took some of its fruit and ate it. So there's your first one. But then it says she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. There's your second one. In verse 12, later, the man replied, The woman you gave to be with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate. You know, perhaps Eve repeated the same lies to Adam that Satan had told her. But regardless of how it happened, we know that Satan used Eve on that occasion to, uh, to continue in his enticements. Another example is found in Matthew chapter 16 and verses 21 through 23. It tells us that from then on, Jesus began to point out to his disciples that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed, and be raised the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Oh no, Lord, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned and told Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me because you're not thinking about God's concerns, but human concerns. So I want you to recognize that Satan can even tempt people through those who express faith and have good intentions, as he did here with Peter. But because Peter was not focused in the right way, Satan exploited that as an opportunity to then tempt Jesus. So, Sinners will try to entice you. The world is full of sinners. You are a recovering sinner, and Satan often works through others. But now, let's focus some more there in Proverbs chapter 1, and let's notice how sinners entice you. Let's understand the way that Satan uses them to entice you. One thing that we notice in that reading is that there's an opportunity to join these who are engaged in evil. These enticements can often and properly be called peer pressure. First, the people who are enticing you are your peers, right? They're people who belong to the same societal group as you do. Your family, your circle of friends, your coworkers, your classmates, your neighbors, right? Same circle um, that you are in. They are your peers. And second, then they apply pressure so that you act in specific ways. All of this pressure, though, boils down to the invitation to be with your peers. I want to really emphasize that word. Right? Proverbs 1 verse 11, they say, come with us. Right? Verse 14, throw in your lot with us. Right? So there's power in that, in that pressure of be with us, join us. 
If you go along with whatever that person or that group is enticing you to do, you can be with them. You'll be accepted by them. You'll be likable to them. You'll have an identity as being part of that group. But if you don't go along with whatever the person or the group is enticing you to do, you will not be with them. So you may not be accepted by them. You may not be liked by them. You, may, you will have to find your identity in some other way. You may even experience consequences for not being with them. In fact, you may be the only one among your group of peers who are not with them. And therefore, you must stand alone. And oftentimes, this pressure takes precedence over what is actually done. For example, Proverbs chapter 1 pictures the opportunity to be with them as overwhelming any conscience that the individual might have concerning hurting or murdering others and taking what does not rightfully belong to you. Most times, those who throw their lot in with these sinners find themselves going further than they wanted to go or ever intended to go. But yet, once you throw your lot in with them, it's difficult to separate yourself from them. So a key part of how Satan is using these sinners to entice us is the opportunity to join and be with them. Next, there are treasures and or pleasures that are promised if you'll be with them. The pressure that sinners provide is often rooted in the promises of experiencing earthly pleasures or gaining earthly treasures that are appealing to your physical desires. And this is part of what makes their, their offer so enticing. Look at the various promises made by those in Proverbs chapter 1. In verse 11, they offer fun. If they say, come with us, let's set an ambush and kill someone. Let's attack some innocent person just for fun. So if you join us, you'll have a good time in what we're going to do. And if you don't join us, you're going to really miss out on a lot of fun. We also saw valuable possessions promised in verses 13 and 14. We'll find all kinds of valuable property and fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot with us and we'll, we'll all share the loot. Right? If you join us, you're going to get things you've always wanted. And if you don't join us, well, you're going to miss out. You're not going to get these things. Verse 19, you have the opportunity to make a profit. He says, such are the paths of all who profit, who make profit dishonestly. It takes the lives of those who receive it. So if you join us, you're going to prosper financially. But if you don't join us, you're not going to make as much money as the rest of us. And you carefully evaluate how the enticements of these individuals use the promises of treasures and or pleasures of this life. Without this component of the pressure, it may be easier to resist them, but, but with the promise of the, pre, uh, the pleasure or the treasure that you would actually like to have or you'd actually like to experience, well, now it makes it even more desirable to conform to what they want you to do. But then the third way as we think about how sinners entice you is that they don't make any mention of the consequences. Sin never fairly represents itself. And so we just need to know that. Satan wants you to look at all of what he'll paint as positive things about the pressure he's applying through your peers. And you can see that in Proverbs chapter 1. Right? Who doesn't want to be with another person or group of people? Who doesn't want to enjoy the pleasures and or treasures of this life? So Satan paints those pictures, and he gets our focus on those things. But what Satan does not want you 
as well as those who are enticing you to realize is the consequences of what's going to happen if you go along with the enticements. And go back through, and you can read that section in Proverbs 1 very carefully. And what you can notice is there's two voices in that text. One is the voice of wisdom, like a father speaking to a son. And one is the voice of the sinners who are doing the enticing. And if you look at that text and think about those two voices, you'll notice something very specific. The voice of the sinners only speaks of the things we've already identified, right? The opportunity, be with us, the pleasures, the treasures. They don't, they never mention any kind of negative things that's going to happen if you join them. But the, it, the voice of re, the wisdom, in fact, only the voice of wisdom, speaks about the consequences of listening to those sinners. Look at set, verses 17 through 19 again. It is useless, this voice says, to spread a net where any bird can see it. But they set an ambush to kill themselves. They attack their own lives. Such are the paths of all who make profit dishonestly. It takes the lives of those who receive it. So if sinners entice you, they won't mention the negative things that will happen to you and others if you go along with them. And by not mentioning these things, it can sure make it seem as if the enticement only has the potential for a positive impact on your life. And so it does not fairly represent itself. But next, so we've seen that sinners will entice you, how sinners will entice you, but now let's focus on how to make the right choice when we're in these situations. The first thing, the first key, is to recognize you have a choice. Satan sure wants it to seem as if you don't. Satan sure wants it to to feel as if you have no choice but to conform your life to how the others want you to live. But it's crucial that you recognize your ability to choose which path you'll travel down. Notice the indications of a choice in Proverbs chapter 1 with me. In verse 10, don't be persuaded. That is, don't consent. And I think about the power of that. Sinners can entice you, but they cannot force you to give your consent to join them. Verse 14, they'd say, throw in your lot with us. Well, although they pressure you to do that, as this pictures, to throw in your lot, to share with them, they cannot make you do so. Verse 15, my son, don't travel that road with them or set foot on their path. Although they walk on that road, they cannot make you put your foot on that road. Right? So you have a choice that you must recognize when sinners entice you. Next, if you want to make the right choice, you must listen to wisdom. Wisdom is speaking as a father would speak to a son about the reality of peer pressure in this passage in Proverbs 1. And wisdom will help you make the right decisions as you face peer pressure so that you'll experience favorable Uh, results as opposed to the consequences of foolish living. That's how this reading began in Proverbs 1 verses 8 and 9. He says, listen, my son, to your father's instruction and don't reject your mother's teaching, for they will be a garland of favor on your head and pendants around your neck. So listen to wisdom from God. Now the key to using wisdom To help you avoid the enticement of sinners, though, is that you listen to wisdom before the that you are enticed to make the wrong decisions. Notice that this section in Proverbs 1 is is a section of warning about what could happen, right? If sinners entice you. It's it's preparation. 
So this warning needed to be heard prior to the enticement so that then you'll know how to properly respond. Well, many times people go along with the enticements in the moment because that's what most appeals to them. And then they look to wisdom after the fact to try to bail them out of trouble. However, wisdom's calling out for us, calling out for us to know so that we can use it to avoid getting into trouble. But you should not expect wisdom that you run to wisdom after you live for yourself and make foolish decisions and then run to wisdom and expect it to erase all the consequences of your actions as if you had listened to it. You must listen to wisdom beforehand, and then it will have wonderful results. Let's keep reading the rest of Proverbs 1, starting in verse 20. It says, Wisdom calls out in the streets. She makes her voice heard in the public squares. She cries out above this commotion. She speaks at the entrance of the city gates. How long, inexperienced ones, will you love ignorance? How long will you mockers enjoy mocking and you fools hate knowledge? If you respond to my warning, then I will pour out my spirit on you and teach you my words. Since I called out and you refused, extended my hand and no one paid attention, since you neglected all my counsel and did not accept my correction, I in turn wisdom says, will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when trouble and stress overcome you, then they will call me, but I won't answer. They will search for me, but won't find me. Because they hated knowledge, didn't choose to fear the Lord, were not interested in my counsel, and rejected all my correction, they will eat the fruit of their way and be glutted with their own schemes. For the apostasy of the inexperienced will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live securely and be un undisturbed by the dread of danger." So yes, we can listen to wisdom anytime, but don't expect wisdom to bail us out of all the physical consequences we get ourselves into by rejecting it. So we must listen to wisdom and do so before the enticement. Next, we need to evaluate the nature of the people enticing us. Now, certainly it is true that lost sinners can do some good and followers of Jesus can do some things that are wicked. And both of those things are true. But it can be helpful to evaluate the source of enticement. If you recognize the enticement as coming from sinners, go back to Proverbs 1 verse 10, if sinners entice you, well, you should have a pretty good indication that what they want you to do may not be something you should be involved in. And this kind of awareness to the situation will, will help you from following others naively or foolishly and being caught unprepared, that you know that sinners will often entice you to do sinful things. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33 teaches this principle very clearly. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Now certainly you can't avoid all the evil people in this world. But you can be very careful and very wise concerning how much you get involved with them and consider their invitations to participate in them with the proper level of scrutiny. And you, must be, you can be careful about the circumstances you put yourself in with people you know are going to pressure you to go in the wrong directions. Next. How do you make the right choice? You look down the path. As I mentioned, Satan does not want you to look down the path. He does not want you to see the consequences of the sinful actions, as well as those who entice you. Will not mention those sinful those those um, those consequences of the sinful actions. Learning wisdom from God 
will help you recognize that Satan's enticements never stop with just what's being said. Instead, sin will always try to take you further than you wanted to go, keep you longer than you wanted to stay, and cost you far more than you were willing to pay. So take some time to look long and hard down the road they want you to travel. Proverbs 1, as we read verses 17 and 19, demonstrates how you will destroy your own life by following the enticements. That's how the, the Father is presenting this. Right? Look down this road. This is where it leads. Don't get caught up in all these other things. Look down the road, and here's where it ends. And make sure that's where you want to go. In fact, the book of Proverbs often warns about many dangers involved in sinful things. Wisdom teaches us there are many physical consequences for sin, including things like guilt, regret, broken relationship, health problems, ruined reputations, jail time, and even death. And then God teaches there are spiritual consequences for our sin that will result in eternal separation from Him in the fires of hell. Romans 6 verse 23, Revelation 21 verse 8. And then the final part here of how to make the right choice is to make a firm decision. You must make the choice to use the wisdom from God and make a firm and unwavering decision not to go along with them. Some people may want to resist the enticement. Others may initially resist, but then give in later. But yet God shows us we must firmly resist. Look at Proverbs 1, verse 10 again. My son, if sinners entice you, don't be persuaded. Or that is, don't consent. Don't let yourself be persuaded to lower your standards and go along with them. Never give your okay to what they're asking you to do. In verse 15, he tells us, My son, don't travel that road with them or set foot on their path. Although you can change and you can come back to the Lord when after you start down the wrong path, he's, he's showing it, it is much easier to simply never take the first step. Don't set your foot on their path. Don't travel part way down and come back. Don't set your foot on the path. Don't start out. Don't flirt with the sin that they want you to share in. Rather, learn to just say no. You can make the right choice. As we close, Satan uses sinners throughout this world to try to entice you and to entice me to do his will rather than to do God's will. And he's crafty with how he works and uses uh, people in our lives to accomplish this. However, you can and you must not consent to travel down the road that Satan wants you to travel. Instead, you can resist him and obey God.